always a pleasure uh, to have Mike Campbell come back. I actually think of Dr. Campbell as the first of the wave of our sort of specialty development in the Department of Surgery. And you're not the new guy on the block anymore. No, not you know, the new guy it's, anymore. Yeah, I know. It's really um, been inspirational to sort of see the evolution of this um, program here at UC Davis and the, all of the uh, new changes that you've brought along with it. It's really been great. And it's interesting to appreciate that the incidentaloma in the adrenal world has not gone away, nor has the confusion necessarily gone away. Um, but we always look forward to the chance to get a little bit closer to understanding what we're supposed to do. So Dr. Campbell, thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Farmer. Um, I'm not the new kid on the block. That's code for I'm old, getting there quickly. Uh, and when I came here four years ago, one of the goals and initially setting up the endocrine program was to set up an adrenal program. I took a little bit of a backseat to the thyroid program originally, and then I came back to it. And what I quickly realized as we were setting up the adrenal program here was that really in order to have an adrenal program, you had to start doing some education as to the extent and what to do with adrenal disease. And that actually started four years ago. This actually is not the culmination, but what I hope to be kind of a midway point because I'm going around currently and giving this talk to not only the internal medicine providers, but also the primary care providers, and you guys are getting it too. The nice thing about that is now I'll be giving three grand rounds in six months with the same talk, so I can pretty much just use it over and over again. Uh, um, we're going to go over some of the data we use to generate this talk along the way. So that's me. That's how you get a hold of me. I think most of you know that now. Nothing to disclose. Adrenal endocrinoma. What the heck is it? Well, it's not rocket science. I mean, it's any incidentally discovered adrenal mass. You're doing a scan for one thing and you find an adrenal mass on the other. This is a guy that came in with a pneumonia. He's got a big right adrenal mass that we took out a couple of months ago. It's hard to believe that you know somebody could have a mass this size and not really have symptoms from it, but it happens. The body's great at hiding these kinds of things. We typically reserve this for tumors greater than one centimeter. Most of the data is generated on tumors greater than one centimeter. Um, but now the scans are so darn good, we actually pick up masses less than one centimeter all the time. And that's kind of the evolving area in the management of the adrenal incidentaloma. So how common are they? They're really common. That's what it boils down to. And they're becoming more common. And you say, well, why the heck are they becoming more common? Is it the diet? Is it the environment? It's not. It's because our scans are better. And if you look back at the incidence of the adrenal incidentaloma back in the 1980s, most of those studies put the incidence at somewhere around a half a percent. And if you look at the more recent studies, this is one from 2015, the incidence is about 5% of all CT scans. And that's getting pretty close to the autopsy series, which is somewhere around 6 to 7% of uh, all patients have an incidental, have an adrenal tumor in them. The reason this is happening is because, you, as you can tell, our CT scans from 1982, not so great, big cuts, low resolution. Our CT scans from 2015, you can make an argument, or maybe even too good. Um, you can pick up these tiny little nodules as seen here in the left adrenal gland. The other reason they're becoming more common is that we're scanning older patients, and our, everybody knows our patient population is getting older. It's not uncommon. I get patients in their 90s now in my clinic, and adrenal incidentalomas become more common as patients age. So if you're the 20-year-old coming in with your appendicitis and you get your CT scan, chance of me seeing something on that CT scan in your adrenal is actually pretty low. It's less than 1%. But if you're the 70-year-old coming in with your diverticulitis and you get a CT scan, there's actually about a 1 in 12 chance I'm going to see something in that adrenal gland and have to figure out what to do with it. So this is really the crux of the whole talk here. How often are those incidentally discovered adrenal tumors anything important? I think the general consensus is most of the time they're not. I'd say that's actually probably true. This is the most recent data on this. This is actually a meta-analysis that was done as part of the new European guidelines, which are very good. And if you residents are ever looking for guidance in this, pull this up. It's in the European Journal of Endocrinology, 2016. And in that meta-analysis, they found if you look at medical series, so patients that are not operated on, about 75% of the time, that incidentally discovered adrenal tumor is a benign, non-functioning adrenal cortical adenoma. What's interesting, though, is about 15% of the time, it's a hormone-producing adrenal cortical adenoma. 
I'm going to round these numbers. About 5% of the time it's going to be a pheo, and about 5% of the time it's going to be some type of adrenal cortical cancer. I usually excuse metastases because usually we know about those before we scan the patient. If you look at surgical series, the numbers differ a little bit, but they're relatively similar. Again, most of the time it's your benign, non-functioning adrenal cortical adenomas. About 15% of the time it's going to be a functioning tumor. It goes up to 10% of the time it's a pheo, and about 10% of the time it's a cancer. And you say, well, why do the numbers change between the two of them? The reason is when a surgeon takes somebody to the OR, they usually have a higher index of suspicion. That's number one. Number two is actually, I'm pretty convinced the incidence of non-functioning pheochromocytomas is underestimated uh, in the population, as well probably patients that we write off as having adrenal cortical adenomas who actually probably have just some latent adrenal cortical carcinoma that we never follow them enough to know about. So all the residents are like, you know what? Adrenal, cortical, adrenal tumors are really common. 20% of the time, there's something I should be dealing with, yet I'm not doing many adrenal cases. So why does that happen? All right? The number one reason, actually, is that most adrenal tumors never get worked up. Uh, and that's part of, kind of the part of this talk. And the second part of the reason is, is that uh, we have a tendency to blow them off. You know, we get a scan for one thing. We realize, oh, patient has appendicitis. We deal with the appendicitis. And then we kind of just forget about it at that point. In the primary care setting, in the internal medicine setting, this actually becomes more prevalent. And the reason it becomes more prevalent is, you forget, most primary care providers, they don't necessarily look at the CT scan. Surgeons do. We understand anatomy. We like anatomy. So we look at the CT. But if you get a CT scan, this is a lady trauma patient I saw a couple weeks ago, I think, a little old lady who had a ground level fall. And you look at her CT scan, it's just absolutely littered with incidentals all the way through. And you're relying on the provider who ordered the scan to kind of go through this. But, you know, luckily at the bottom of the report, the radiologist kind of gives us their impression. But often the impression is somewhat terse and I think has a tendency to kind of leave some things out. And if you can see with this one, lady fell, she has no acute traumatic injury, and she's got these incidentals, including some uh, renal uh, nephrolithiasis. You completely missed the fact that she's got an adrenal tumor which is listed in the bulk of the report. And I can guarantee you the patient never knows and probably the ER physician that ordered it never knew either. So the whole point of this talk is for me to basically say, listen, the majority of these are going to be benign, non-functioning adenomas, but some of them are going to be important. And the ones that are going to be important are the ones you got to make sure you try to at least do uh, a decent workup on to figure out. And you say, well, how do you know this is going to be important, Dr. Campbell? And the reason is because I've seen the ones that are. And this is a patient that me and Dr. Farkas share, and I love to tell this story, even though it's kind of a, kind of a morbid story, but it's a, it's a story that I think really captures it. This is a very nice woman. She's 73. She has some smoldering diverticulitis. And as you know, she's last three, four months, she's starting to get a little more distended. She's not tolerating much of a diet. Uh, she's not feeling well, so she gets a CT scan with her primary care provider. On that CT scan, she's got this two centimeter nodule in the right adrenal gland pretty benign looking. It's got a little bit of fat in it. Um, but she makes her way to Dr. Farkas uh, for a presumed diverticular stricture. And Dr. Farkas looks at the CT and says, you know, she's got something in her adrenal. Better figure out what that is. And me and Dr. Farkas used to share a clinic in the cancer center. So we just kind of moved her from one room to the next. And I saw the patient and I looked at it and I said, you know, looks pretty benign to me. Got it. But I know this woman's going to need a colectomy uh, coming up here pretty soon. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send off a set of metanephrines on her to make sure Linda has a safe operation. Linda books her for the next week. This is a Wednesday. I actually fly out to Florida for a meeting on that Friday. Uh, and we have the residents going to follow up on the metanephrines. And come Monday morning, I get a call and said, hey, remember that lady that's in Farkas' clinic? I say, yeah. She goes, her metanephrines are four times the upper limit of normal. Oh, man. she got a feel. So we call the patient, we say, listen, you got this tumor, it's producing too many catecholamines, we're going to need to cancel your surgery, which is coming up in a couple of days, and we're going to set you up in Dr. Campbell's clinic in two days to talk about it. And her daughter answers the phone and says, I'm really glad you called, mom's not feeling well. She started her bowel prep last night, and she's having fevers, and she looks sick, she's vomiting. Brought her into the ER, where she's tachycardic, she's not looking good, and she went to the OR with Dr. Fan who had a surprise, uh, and I 
talked to Ho before he actually took her to the OR on my cell phone. And it turns out her entire colon was dead, half her small bowel was dead, her uterus was dead, and her ovaries were dead. Because when you have a patient who's volume down, who's clamped down because of her pheo, and then she gets bowel prepped, you essentially send her into ischemia, and uh, you get a shock picture. So she, I just saw her back in clinic. She's actually doing okay. Um, but this is a case where a two centimeter pheochromocytoma incidentally discovered had some major morbidity associated with it. Hmm. And I'm not the only one to miss pheos. This is uh, Dr. Paul Dudley White. He's one of the foremost uh, cardiologists back in the 1950s. He was at Harvard. He was one of the founders of the American Heart Association. Uh, kind of a preventive medicine kind of guy. And the pheo he missed was on this man. Of course, this is Eisenhower. And most people know that Eisenhower died of heart attacks. He actually had eight heart attacks over a course of several years. And after his first heart attack, they actually, of course, bring in a preeminent uh, cardiologist to say, hey, what's going on? How can we make this guy better? And he said, well, you know, you got to have a good diet. Probably should cut down on your smoking. What he kind of missed was, is Eisenhower had been having some headaches and his primary care had been plotting his blood pressure when he was having these headaches. And what he would notice is every time he had a headache, he'd get a spike in his blood pressure. And this went on for quite a long time. And it wasn't until after uh, Eisenhower died after his eighth heart attack that they did an autopsy and they found a two centimeter pheo and left a dream. So with that, sets my talk. <laughs> I'm a very simple surgeon. I operate on three organs. I don't have to reconstruct the organs, I just take it out. And when it comes to adrenals, I only ask two questions. Is it a cancer and is it functional? And that's what I want all you guys, especially the residents, to take home, especially in the last week in July, or sorry, January when you're taking your abscites. Get, get an adrenal question, is it a cancer, is it functional? You get those two right, you're gonna have this thing nailed. You could be an endocrine surgeon. Not like that's not all that hard. All right, is it a cancer? All, most of the data that's presented uh, in your guys' textbooks and for the most part talks about size and as a predictor of cancer. And the truth matter, this comes out of the original 2002 NIH guidelines where we really relied on size as a predictor of malignancy. And size is pretty good. It turns out when you just take all comers uh, and you basically say, okay, is the tumor less than four centimeters? It turns out most of those are benign, only about 2% are cancers. We usually recommend observation for those patients. Tumors greater than six centimeters, about 25% of those are cancers. So we usually rec that recommend that come out once we realize it's not, as long as we know it's not a met. And if it's four to six centimeters, we consider that a little bit of an indeterminate range, has a roughly a five to 6% chance it's a cancer. And you know, a lot of times we'll consider surgery on those patients depending on patient risk factors and patient preference. But size is not everything. We really have moved a lot towards the imaging characteristics of the tumor. And it's all based upon this. Most adrenal incidentalomas are, I'm sorry, are adenoma, I'm sorry. Most adrenal incidentalomas are lipid-rich adenomas. Fat, these are benign by definition. We don't think there's an adenoma to carcinoma progression within the adrenal gland. Fat is really low density on CTs, especially non-contrasted CTs. So we usually say if you get a non-con CT and it's less than 10 Hounsfield units, that has a very high predictability for being a lipid-rich adenoma and therefore benign. Most of these studies were based in the 1980s, or 1990s, early 1990s, where they basically took a bunch of C serial CT scans and they said, okay, what kind of, what is our predictability if this patient has a low attenuation on their non-con? This is kind of the classic study. It was a pseudo-meta-analysis it was 270 benign patients, 223 malignant patients. I want you to point out here, if you look at the malignant patient, the vast majority are metastases, which you can make an argument is acts a little different than adrenal cortical cancer. Also, pheos have a tendency to act a little different, but uh, aside from splitting hairs, um, we're gonna group those all together. As with almost all radiology studies, the histological diagnosis is almost always missing or actually fairly poorly defined within the studies. A lot of these patients were designed uh, or actually diagnosed with an adenoma based upon serial TCTs in which the tumor did not grow. Hence the reason in the surgical series you see a lot of non-functioning pheos and things like that when the patient actually gets taken to the operating room and taken out. It was actually probably originally diagnosed as an adenoma. 
And what we see is if you have a Hounsfield units of less than 10 on your non-contrast CT, you have a 98% specificity for saying that is a lipid-rich adenoma, don't need to worry about it. 2% chance of missing something. And that's pretty good. But of course, no one gets a non-contrast CT scan, right? And so almost all of our patients need to be re-imaged at some point. And then the other problem we get into is if you actually get a non-contrast CT scan and it's greater than 10, and the tumor you're looking at is greater than 10 Hounsfield units, that means it's a cancer. I mean, you're talking about a fair number of patients there because about 30% of adenomas are actually lipid poor and actually have a relatively high Hounsfield units when you get a non-contrast CT scan. When you have that situation where your Hounsfield units is up a little bit, that's when we start talking about washout. And this comes up in the textbooks quite a bit. Washout really relies on the fact that adenomas take up contrast quickly and then wash out contrast quickly. So what we do is we get a multi-phase CT, one that you get a, a non-contrast phase at zero, you get then an arterial phase at 90 seconds, then you're going to get a washout phase at 15 minutes, and we're going to look for how quickly it takes up that contrast and washes it out, and we have these numbers, we call it relative washout, absolute washout, actually knowing how to calculate them is less important because there's all types of calculators on Google that can take you through that. But what is important is understanding that if you have about a 60% washout at 15 minutes, you have about a 96% chance of being adrenal cortical adenoma, which is not as good as having a CT scan with a low Hounsfield units, but it's still pretty good. Now, residents that rotate with me in the surgical oncology service, they know I'm not a huge fan of washout. It's not that I don't like it. I've just been burned by it in the past. And the one I get burned by all the times is Fios. This is a patient who was sent to my clinic. He's got a left adrenal tumor here. Uh, and on his washout CT, it was sent to me. It was read as washout consistent with left adrenal adenoma. First thing I say when I went through his scan, I actually went through his scan first, as I do with many of my patients. I said, what the heck is this right adrenal? Somebody took it out already. And then I started reading about it. Turns out the guy has MEN1, or sorry, has MEN2. And when the patient has MEN2, he has a really high pretest probability for having a FEO. If you send off his metanephrines, they were actually only mildly elevated, but I felt pretty strong that he did have a FEO um, based upon his clinical history. And when we got in there, he actually didn't have one FEO, he actually had five FEOs. Uh, this is what they look like. Some patients with MEN will have these kind of small one centimeter FEOs that essentially just litter the uh, adrenal gland up and down. So, but he's doing great, status post bilateral adrenalectomy. So he said, what about adrenal biopsy? We're trying to rule out a cancer. We biopsy everything else, right? Breast tumor, what do we do? We biopsy it. Lung, biopsy it. Turns out, biopsies of the adrenals is really not very good and therefore not recommended. Again, recent meta-analysis out of those European guidelines, they looked at 1,600 adrenal masses. I think the key parts of this here, non-diagnostic rate approaching 10%. The complication rate was reported at 2.5%, but it's likely underreported. I agree with that. I've actually managed several complications of people trying to biopsy the adrenals. They're very hemorrhagic uh, organs. There's Actually, I've had people uh, get a pneumothorax from that biopsy. But what it really boils down to is this. I think if you're trying to rule out adrenal cortical cancer, your sensitivity, if you get a bio negative biopsy, is only about 70%. So if you're trying to rule out an adrenal cortical cancer and you say, hey, there's a 30% chance we're missing it, I don't think that's a very good option. So what do you do if you have a non-diagnostic or indeterminate CT scan that you can't rule out a malignancy? And this is my pitch here. I'd say, actually, I think this is the rule of laparoscopic surgery. And when I give this talk to the endocrinologist or the internist, they just laugh at me. And the reason they do is they say, that's a surgeon talking like a surgeon. You know, you just want to take everything out. And I counter with this. You guys send me indeterminate thyroid nodules all the time. I take those out all the time, and no one even bats an eye. And when you look at the two operations, they're actually remarkably similar. This is a four centimeter thyroid nodule we took out a couple of months ago. It took me two hours. We didn't lose much blood. Stayed in the hospital overnight. I quoted the patient a less than 5% complication rate. This is a four centimeter right adrenal nodule tumor that we took out a couple of months ago. It took me three hours, minimal blood loss overnight stay, less than 5% complication rate. So I actually think the indeterminate uh, adrenal mass is actually probably best suited with laparoscopic adrenalectomy and well-suited well patients. 
What is the bottom line? This is what you need to take home. When determining if an adrenal incidentaloma is a malignant a tumor size is important most of them are going to be greater than four centimeters but don't forget the imaging characteristics and if you have a CT that's less than a non-contrast CT less than 10 ounce field units you could feel pretty comfortable that's going to be a benign tumor although the, there is some data holes especially in larger tumors with relatively low ounce field units there is really a limited role for image guided biopsy um, I think I use it personally in patients with a history of extra adrenal malignancy that can spread to the adrenal um, before you stick a needle in anything in the adrenal, please rule out a FIO. Uh, that's kind of a classic question. And then I always say consider adrenal, a diagnostic adrenalectomy or laparoscopic adrenalectomy in patients that you're just not sure about. Second question, is it functional? Really there's only three to four hormones that we care about when we talk about functional adrenal tumors. We care about catecholamines. We care about aldosterone primary aldosteronism. We care about cortisol or Cushing syndrome, and occasionally we care about virilization and hyperandrogenism. Of the, all those, of course, the FIOs are the coolest. These are some FIOs we've taken out in the last couple of months here. They are remarkably variable in how they look on CT. You have these huge FIOs like this one. This is a cystic FIO which is extremely uncommon, but the first one I've seen, but they have been reported in the past. And of course, you have the guy that has them, numerous FIOs in the hereditary uh, setting. When we talk about FIOs, the classic kind of thought behind FIOs is patients with FIOs present with symptoms, headaches, sweats, hyperandrogenic symptoms, very thin. Um, and that is true for the most part. This is one of Kwan Du's studies. They looked at 100 patients with FIOs, and you can still see the majority of patients present with symptoms. But I think I want to point out is about 30% of patients with FIOs actually have it found essentially as an incidentaloma on a CT scan. And of those patients that have incidentalomas, about half of them aren't taking a blood pressure medicine. Now, of course, the diagnosis of the pheochromocytoma depends on the essentially demonstration of catecholamine excess. And as you remember, catecholamines are metabolized within the chromaffin cells of the field to metanephrine. All right, so norepinephrine becomes normetanephrine. Epinephrine becomes metanephrine. Now, historically, we always teach uh, our students and whatnot to test for FIO by checking for catecholamines or sending off serum catecholamines, 24 hour urine catecholamines. But the problem is, is that plasma and urine catecholamines are actually could be normal in a patient that has a FIO in between kind of FIO crisis or FIO spells. Metanephrines are actually produced somewhat continuously based upon the chromophin mass of the tumor. And therefore, you get a lot less peaks and valleys associated with it. And this is kind of a good graphic that displays that. This is a patient with a FIO. Essentially, they get their metanephrines and catecholamines measured on three consecutive days. Whoops. This dotted line is the upper limit of normal. And what you can see is the normetanephrine essentially stays above the upper limit of normal for all three days, where the norepinephrine essentially peaks above the upper limit of normal one time over this three-day period. Metanephrines do the same exact thing. They stay above, where epinephrine essentially only peaks once over that three-day period. One of the questions I get a lot is, well, what is the best test to get? Should I get a urine metanephrine? Should I get a plasma metanephrine? And in my mind, it actually doesn't make much of a difference. The sensitivity to rule out a FIO, which is most of the time what you're trying to do, most of the time you're trying to prove that the patient doesn't have a FIO, is actually really good with either one of those tests. The plasma is a lot easier to get, so I usually go with plasma as my first uh, line test. But I think what's really important to point out with metanephrines is, although the sensitivity is relatively high, the specificity is not very high. So it's really good to rule out a FIO. It's not so good to rule one in. And the way to think of it is this. If you have a high sensitivity and you're trying to rule out a FIO, your chance that an adrenal, incidentally discovered adrenal tumor is a FIO is 5%. If you have a sensitivity of 98%, that gives you a negative likelihood ratio of 0.04. 0.04 times 5% means that if you have a negative metanephrine, your chance of having a FIO um, is actually 0.2% in that patient. Essentially ruled it out. 
It's not going to happen. But with the specificity in the high 80s, mid 80s, if you take that 5% and you multiply it by a positive likelihood ratio of 6-ish, if you have an elevated metanephrine, the chance that that adrenal tumor is actually a pheo is somewhere in the 25 to 30% range, which for most people would say, that's eh, not that great. I'm not sure you actually have a pheo. You might. So Jock Lenders took this up actually almost a decade, over a decade ago now, and he kind of was one of the big proponents of this idea of, uh, of uh, trying to kind of come up with these adjusted reference ranges and what should be the correct range in metanephrine to say the patient has a pheo. And it wasn't rocket science. He's a receiver operator uh, characteristic curve to essentially say, okay, what is this? At what point are the metanephrines high enough where I have 100% specificity to say that this truly is a pheochromocytoma? And it turns out in most of the studies, it's pretty producible. It's somewhere around three to four, per, four, three to four times the upper limit of normal. And if you look at the labs when you order it, they even say that in the bottom, that most patients with pheo will have metanephrines in excess of three times the upper limit of normal. So this is where the confusion comes in the test, because you really have this kind of adjusted reference ranges when you send off metanephrines. If you send off the test and it's below the upper limit of normal, you have a high sensitivity, you essentially say that patient doesn't have a pheo. If you send off the test and it's greater than three times the upper limit of normal, you essentially say, this patient very likely has a pheo, you have very high specificity. <laughs> the question always is, what do you do with the patients in the middle? This becomes a very complex question, about 20 to 30 percent of patients fall into this range, and what I usually say, give me a call at that point and we'll figure it out together. The bottom line is, almost everyone with an adrenal incidentaloma should be screened for a pheochromocytoma. I recommend you use plasma or urometanephrines. A normal metanephrines essentially excludes a pheo, but an elevated test doesn't necessarily rule one in. All right, very quickly on primary aldosteronism. Primary aldosteronism, somewhat uncommon. Patients will present with medically refractory hypertension, classically with hypokalemia, although really only about 20 or 30 percent of patients have that. We screen for it by a serum aldosterone to renin activity ratio. That's the test answer. The truth though is, anytime you have a suppressed renin, your plasma aldosterone to renin ratio is always gonna be greater than the number they give you, which is greater than 20 to suggest disease. So there's kind of this unwritten rule that we say, to really suggest primary aldosteronism, you really should have an absolute aldosterone of greater than 15. My clinical pearl on this, these tumors are really, really small. These are some aldos we've taken out in the last year. You can see they're about a centimeter in size. You can barely even see them on the CT scan. They're often missed, often not called by the uh, radiologist. Two-thirds of primary aldosteronism actually occurs because of bilateral adrenal hyperplasia. About one-third occurs because of a, a unilateral uh, aldosterone-secreting adenoma or aldosteronoma. So almost all of these patients are going to need venous sampling to essentially determine if they have unilateral disease or bilateral disease. Why is that important? If the patient has unilateral disease, you could do a surgery and you could help that patient. If they have bilateral disease, you can't take out both adrenals, or at least you probably shouldn't take out both adrenals for primary aldosteronism. Um, and usually we prefer aldosterone antagonists in those med patients. Uh, how good is surgery? It's actually really good for these patients. These patients love this surgery because they've been put on escalating doses of medications for years and years and years, and all of a sudden you do a surgery and you're able to take them off. And they want it, they send you Christmas cards because of it. You have basically a 100% resolution of all hypokalemia. About a half of patients will come off all their hypertension meds, usually the younger patients. The other half will usually be able to decrease the amount of meds they take or uh, by usually half to two thirds. In general, the earlier the surgery, the better. So again, if you get them young before they start to get that arterial stiffness, then typically they'll do better. And the third syndrome we test for is Cushing's. Okay, everyone has an idea of what a Cushing's patient looks like. It looks like this kid, right? Moon facies, buffalo hump, striae. But the truth of the matter is actually we rarely see that nowadays. This is the more clinical, this is a more uh, common, whoops, common Cushing's patients nowadays. Kind of looks like every other person that you might see in your clinic. 
And because of that, we don't actually call these patients Cushing syndrome, we call them subclinical Cushing syndrome. So it's the subtle autonomous cortisol hypersecretion that is really insufficient to generate this kind of clinically recognizable syndrome. It probably occurs in five to 10% of adrenal tumors. What do we know about it? We know that the risk of progressing to overt Cushing's is actually quite low. It's probably in the 1% range over uh, five to 10 years. But we also know there's been a lot of studies that say that people with subclinical Cushing's have higher incidence of diabetes, higher incidence of hypertension, higher incidence of cardio uh, cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, and actually mortality. One of the problems with subclinical Cushing's is we don't have a good test to uh, screen for it. These are the more common tests that we use, dex suppression, urinary free cortisols, midnight cortisols, ACTH. And I want to point out the most important thing here is really the best test we have is the dex suppression test, and really the sensitivity of that is only about 80%, but it's what we go with for now. People, uh, one thing I always have to explain is the dex suppression test. How does it work? I think it's important to kind of understand the basics of it. Remember, your pituitary produces ACTH. That stimulates the adrenal gland to produce cortisol, and then you get a negative feedback to the pituitary to stop producing that ACTH. When we give dexamethasone, essentially, we give a steroid, okay? If we give a steroid, that drops your ACTH, and that should, in a physiologic setting, drop your cortisol. If I give you dexamethasone, and the next morning, your cortisol is still elevated, then you have autonomous secretion of cortisol, and that's probably coming from a tumor somewhere. So when we do a dex suppression test, what we're looking for is an elevated level of cortisol following the administration of dexamethasone, and we use various cutoffs for what is elevated. In general, it's important to know that a lot of people use 1.8, and the reason they use it is it has a very high sensitivity to pick up Cushing's disease, or Cushing's syndrome, but a relatively poor specificity. A lot of surgeons will use five micrograms, and the reason is it has a relatively high specificity to rule in Cushing's syndrome. Personally, how I think of it is very similar to how I think about FIOs. If I get a dex suppression test and it's less than 1.8, although the sensitivity is not great, I usually say, I don't think this patient's gonna have clinically significant Cushing's. I'm gonna say they don't. I'm not gonna get any more testing at this point. If it's greater than five micrograms after I do a dex suppression, I usually say, they, yeah, I think they likely have Cushing's. I'm gonna check an ACTH to evaluate for Cushing's disease or ACTH dependent cortisol secretion. And I usually get a confirmation test uh, just to confirm that it wasn't a spurious test. And if it falls in between, I say, ah, they could have Cushing's, they could not. Sometimes I'll follow those patients for a couple of years. Sometimes I'll just check some more tests and see how they do. Aside from actually making the diagnosis, what you really want to know, though, is who are you going to help if they actually have the syndrome? And we're going to quickly skip over, uh, go over these quickly. There's relatively poor data, but there's been essentially two studies that have kind of suggested that some patients do benefit if you do take out these cortisol secreting tumors. This is the first one. This is the Italian study. It was a non-randomized study. It's about 40 patients, about 20 in each arm, 15 to 20 in each arm. And they basically took a group that went to the OR and had an adrenalectomy for their subclinical Cushing's, another group that was managed with best medical management. And the take home message is, if you went to surgery, about half the patients see an improvement or cure in their hypertension, about half see an improvement or cure in their diabetes, about a, you know, 20 to 30% will see an improvement in their lipids, you'll get some weight improvement out of it, uh, not a ton of improvement in your osteoporosis. But if you don't go to surgery and you're med managed medically, essentially all those patients either get worse or stay the same. Second study, this was a randomized study, almost identical results. Again, if you go to surgery, about half the patients notice an improvement in their diabetes or cure in their diabetes, their hypertension, their lipids, their weight, where if you don't go to surgery, all the patients either get worse or stay the same. So the bottom line with subclinical Cushing's, uh, again, I really feel like every patient with an adrenal tumor should be screened for Cushing's disease. I use the dexamethasone suppression test because I feel like it has the best sensitivity, and I think that's the way we're currently going. The risk to overt Cushing's is low, so you could tell your patient, listen, you don't have to worry about that. And I think I really think surgeries can be considered in patients with select comorbidities. So 
how are we doing here at UC Davis, and specifically, how have we done in the past? This is Jim Becker's study. We are now currently on about the third or fourth revision of this paper uh, with the editors, <laughs> but we're going to get it. <laughs> uh, and this was done actually before I got here. This is data that kind of when I first got here. And Jim, what he did was he looked at 4,678 CT scans ordered by primary care physicians within our uh, primary care network. Uh, and basically said, okay, how many of those had an adrenal tumor? Well, about 4.9% had an adrenal tumor, very consistent with other studies. But we use really strict criteria to define the incident aloma. We excluded patients with malignancies. We excluded patients that wish that tumor had already been discovered. And our true incident aloma rate was about 1.7%, of which 15 patients had an appropriate hormone workup, uh, and about 35% had some, I'm sorry, 35 patients had some type of reimaging to evaluate for malignancy. Of the patients who got a workup, uh, that was only 22 patients uh, total. Some of them had patients had a partial workup. Uh, about you know about 20% had evidence of subclinical Cushing's. About 40% had evidence of primary aldosteronism. No one had an obvious feel, but none were referred for an adrenalectomy. And then we went ahead and did a survey of our primary care providers who actually were ordering the scans, and we basically tried to get a sense of kind of how they manage these patients. Uh, and what we found is about 70% really didn't think anybody needed a hormonal workup unless you had symptoms from it. Most of the, most of the providers didn't think you really needed to do any re-imaging to evaluate for malignancy. This is really interesting. 60% of the respondents said they felt uncomfortable doing the evaluation, yet 60% of them essentially said, I do it myself anyways. So, uh, you know, in conclusion, we found that really few patients with adrenal tumors uh, discovered in the primary care setting undergoing a hormonal evaluation or any type of repeat imaging, and we feel it really leads to an under-recognition of potentially treatable disease. So how have we dealt with this? This has been kind of my project for the last year. We've taken a little bit of a systems-wide approach. Actually, we got together an adrenal tumor board. We meet in the third, Tuesday, uh, third Thursday of every month now. As part of that, I not only brought in the endocrinologist, but I also brought in the radiologist. And you might notice this now is we have some new language as part of our templates. Uh, so anytime you see an adrenal tumor, or say anytime an adrenal tumor is noted on the CT scan, it's going to be included in the impression, and it ha we have some kind of standard knowledge, uh, language that we've agreed upon. It's going to basically mention the need for re-imaging, the need for a hormonal workup, and the need for probably somebody with some experience to kind of evaluate that patient. And we'll see how this pays dividends in the next couple of months for the next paper that we're going to write. So. In closing, for all of you on the trauma service, you're going to see an adrenal tumor. I guarantee it. What do I do now? More than happy to let you work it up yourself, but you're also more than welcome to call me about it. Um, one thing I would add is please put a referral into endocrine surgery. That comes straight to me. The uh, schedulers in the cancer center send them right to me so I have a chance to look at them. More than happy to have you send me a message about the patient, but please put in the referral to make sure they actually make it to my clinic. Um, if you want me to see the patient in-house, call me on my cell phone, call the surgical oncology pager and have them come get me. Um, because I usually, unless uh, I know the patient is someone you want me to see, I'm not gonna necessarily kind of come over to the hospital unless I have time to come see the patient. Who should I see? You know, I think probably tumors greater than four centimeters would be a good person for me to see. There's a little higher risk of malignancy in those patients. I'd really love them to give them my card, explain to them that probably I should see them as an outpatient. And I think the other one is the patient that you think might have a FIO that needs to be started on alpha blockade before they leave the hospital. Uh, that would be a good one for me to see and, and talk to them about it. In summary, adrenal incident alomas are common. Most are benign, non-functioning tumors. But about five to ten percent, I'm sorry, about ten to fifteen percent are going to be hormonally active, and another five percent are going to be malignant. The adrenal protocol CT is our test of choice for distinguishing uh, benign from malignant lesions. It's basically a non-contrast CT with uh, delayed contrast phases. If you leave UC Davis and you need to tell the radiologist what you want. Go ahead and get a metanephrine uh, to rule out a FIO, not a catecholamines. I think it's a good idea to get a DEX suppression test to look for subclinical Cushing's. And I think we have some room for improvement on how to manage these patients here, but I think we're taking some steps in the right direction. I'm hopeful over the next couple of years we'll start to actually have some pretty good algorithms in place. And that's it.
uh, great Mike, and there's really no truth to the, oh, the endocrine surgeons are just simple surgeons. <laughs> <laughs> you just spelled that wrong. We've got some questions. Time for questions. So I don't get the medicine while they're in house after a trauma because the medicine's with the test. So do you want this responsibility getting the medicine or just talking to you first? In general, I, I, I try to not do the workup while the patient's in house from an acute injury because I think it just confuses the picture. This is the way to think of it. If you get the metanephrines, they come back negative, it's negative, right? But if they come back positive, I think you kind of are left in this thing, well, what are you gonna do with it? Like, you know, are you gonna start the patient on alpha blockade? Is it just from the fact they just got a chest tube put in? You know, so in general, I try not to, but I think it's different. You get different clinical pictures. I mean, somebody here, I can't remember who it was, but they admitted a patient a couple of months ago and the patient had blood pressures of 240 and a four centimeter right adrenal tumor. And I mean, that patient, I don't know, it's not a bad idea to probably get a metanephrines and see if they're sky high, because there's a high pretest probability of having a feel in that patient. You could help the patient by starting them on an alpha blocker and getting them over to a clinic where they could be managed. Um, I really enjoyed So that is a great question. The new ACR white paper that came out. Oh, so American College of Radiology produces guidance just like all major organizations do. Their old guidance, one the previous version, actually downplayed adrenals quite a bit because they see a ton of it. They really do. Um, and it really wasn't very evidence-based. I think it was kind of one of those ones where they just kind of blew it off. The new guidance actually now mimics the Endocrine Society's guidance and the um, AES guidance. And so really the radiologist should be on board now with essentially not skipping over the adrenal incidentaloma, or at least alerting the provider to this, this could be something, okay? Um, how did I do it? It's actually, I show up on their doorstep all the time. And I say, what do you think about this? Do you guys notice this? What do you know? And it was just through that communication. And I think that's really one of the keys about being, you know, setting up one of these systems-based things is you have to find allies in different departments. Um, and once you found that ally, they could kind of fight that battle within the department for you. Um, and that's what's happening here. Uh, Ghanae Van Ansipar, Michael Corwin, they're on board with this now. And now we're starting to see you know, the rest of the radiologists come along uh, because those two guys have been champions for it. As Margaret Mead said, mostly you make a difference one person at a time. Yeah. Bob. Great, great talk. Yeah. I know the focus was sort of, uh, you know, radiographically detectable uh, lesions, but can you talk a little bit about localization because it's, it, it has been known to happen where you can have an incidentaloma and a functional lesion and they're not one and the same thing. Yeah, that's a great question, Bob. Uh, that is a real tough situation. So in other words, adrenal tumors are common, right? You send off a metanephrines, right? Uh, and it's mildly elevated and the patient actually has two tumors, one on each side, right? Um, one of them is a benign adenoma, one's a pheochromocytoma. How do you figure it out? There are functional studies, as you guys know, um, uh, um, that could pick up on uh, functional adrenal tumors. And we also do venous sampling, you know, sometimes to figure that out. Um, but it's a tough situation. And I actually find, for the most part for me, the radiographic characteristics on a good CT scan often will point me in the direction of which one is the tumor. Actually, that cystic feel that we took out, she had bilateral tumors. She had a solid tumor on the left, a cystic feel on the right. And ultimately, I took out the one on the right with a little bit of like, um, it's a little bit nervous going into surgery, but the CT really to me looked more like a FIO, and then that was the right call. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. So you think some of the other localization studies are sort of uh, going by the wayside with high resolution scans? I do. I personally do. Med scans. I, 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 well, you know, for instance, one of the things that's really interesting is like these new gallium scans. They're great for neuroendocrine tumors. They're horrible in the adrenal. Uh, so adrenal is kind of its own beast because you have that functioning med medullary tissue. It throws off things. So I personally don't use a lot of nuke med for adrenal tumors in general. I think high resolution CT is really the way to go, but they're available and you might use them in certain settings. PET scan definitely has a decently high um, 
uh, sensitivity for FIAs. The problem is you also will get pet pickup on just normal adrenal glands. And so you have to take that into account. Great. We appreciate your expertise. We're glad to have you. Thanks. Man.